Ken Green was a uh, professional golfer. He's still alive. Um, in the 80s and the early 90s, he was on the, the PGA Tour. He was a touring professional. He won uh, five, uh, uh, five uh, tournaments on the, on the PGA Tour. Uh, he played in at least one Ryder Cup. Um, he was the real deal. Um, he was uh, a good professional golfer. Listen to his words that he wrote just recently. Ken Green says, the truth is, <clears throat> I wish I hadn't let the nightmare that happened to me as a kid reappear in my brain. <clears throat> After it ended, I did a good job blocking it out. The plan from the beginning was to put it in the back and let it go, hoping it might one day disappear forever. He goes on to say, when I was 11 years old, my mother made the decision to move our family from Connecticut to Honduras. She thought relocating to a foreign country might help, um, uh, might help temper my dad's drinking and save the, the marriage. Instead, the things that happened in my three years there were devastating. Ken says <clears throat> of, his, of his perpetrators, he says, I was told that if I ever said anything, they would kill my mother. They also warned me that if I didn't go along, they would kill my father. Ken says, I'm no psychiatrist. But what I went through at least partly explains why I spiraled into serious depression as an adult and even tried to commit suicide. It probably accounts for why I always, why I always was rebellious toward authority and not good with relationships. To this day, I rarely look people in the eye. That's Ken Green. Another story, uh, Lydia and I, during our time in Albuquerque, uh, we had a couple of dear friends. They weren't in our lives uh, for more than just a few years. But they were dear friends, Chuck and Maggie. They sang in the, the church choir that we were a part of. Uh, Chuck, before I ever met him, when he was about my age, had lost a wife had lost his first wife to cancer. So when we came on the scene, he had, he had already remarried Maggie, who was the principal of the church school that we were a part of, and they were a delightful couple. And uh, while we were a part of their lives, Chuck lost Maggie, his second wife, to a brain aneurysm. And after his death, I remember him bringing to church, to choir practice one night, bringing a really nice leather purse that had belonged to Maggie. He brought it and he gave it to, to Lydia, and it was a really meaningful gift. And Chuck was a really kind man. But to lose two wives in the span of a decade seems like a really raw deal. A third story, David is a friend of mine. You don't know him. He doesn't come to River Church. He recently revealed to me that he has an adult daughter with whom he has no contact whatsoever. In fact, for David, the closest thing he has ever had to a parenting relationship is with his really sweet uh, dog that he has raised from a pup. And the dog, the dog died just a few months ago. And my friend is, uh, he is well acquainted with suffering. 
his daughter, his estranged daughter, who I don't know, is a victim in that story, no doubt. In fact, some of you know this too well, unfortunately, but abandonment is one form of suffering that many people in this room can relate to. It's one of the most common forms of suffering is abandonment. Today we're talking about suffering, and it would be a bummer if we just talked about suffering, but actually the good news, the story of Jesus Christ, the, the gospel, it speaks into our suffering. So today we're going to talk about suffering and the gospel. Let me ask you in your own, in your own mind, silently in your own brain, you can answer this question. What has been your most intense point of suffering? As you look back on your life, and I realize your life isn't over yet, but as you look back on your life, what has been the pinnacle? What has been the most intense moment or period or perhaps even prolonged period of suffering in your life? Suffering comes in many different forms. You know what suffering is. I really don't have to give you a definition, but, but just to, to get our minds going a bit, I'll, I'll say a few words about suffering. It comes, uh, it comes sometimes in the form of a physical pain. Sometimes, rather, it's emotional in nature. It might be illness for you. It might be trauma for you. It might be mistreatment that has happened in your life. As I said earlier, it might be abandonment that you have experienced. Perhaps it was a, it, it is a need in your life that has gone unmet. Uh, a, a, a pretty common, a fairly common form of suffering in a person's life can be confinement. You know, like maybe you're, maybe you're subjected to to the basement, uh, the basement, <laughs> the, the attic, the basement, um, literally, um, or maybe just the hell of the confinement of you putting locks on your heart, never letting anyone in and, and living inside that place all alone. Your suffering may last for a moment, or your suffering may stick around for years on end. And the sad thing is that, that, that for some of you, maybe for most of us, our suffering actually defines us. We look in the mirror and we, we see the suffering. And we believe that the suffering is me, the suffering that you've experienced, it really is you. Maybe you are uh, close to someone who is suffering right now, a relative, a friend, family member, and you're walking through uh, the pain with them at this moment. A very relevant question, in fact, one of the most basic questions in life, goes like this. Where is God when it hurts? You probably asked that. Probably a number of you have asked that question this week. I believe suffering, our, our view of suffering is super significant. Because how we view suffering shapes and makes us as human beings. So, so the way that you see suffering, how you view your own personal uh, uh, suffering, it shapes how you relate, relate to others. Depending on how you see, how you view your own suffering, it may cause you deep shame as you relate to others. It may cause you great anger or fear as you relate to others. How you view suffering shapes the way that you view God. So it's important for us today 
and it's within the context of our, of our scripture passage today, it's important for us today to view suffering through the lens of the story of Jesus, through the lens of the gospel. So that's what we're going to try to do today. Today's sermon is, uh, revolves around the biblical character Joseph. And he's one of the most well-known biblical characters, um, you know, that, that people who do go to church and people who don't go to church, uh, most people remember something of the story of Joseph, the guy that got the colorful coat. Um, <clears throat> so today's sermon, it, it revolves around this character and it revolves around his his suffering. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little about, about Joseph here in a minute, and then we're going to read, read from Genesis. But before I do that, let me say this. I cannot answer all of your questions today regarding human suffering. I'm just not prepared to do that. We don't have enough time to do that, and I'm not wise enough to address every question that you have or every question that I have about suffering. Many of our questions, they're mysteries, and they will be answered on the other side of eternity. So I can't answer every question regarding suffering. Here's what I think I can do. I can present to you a biblical view on suffering with Joseph's story as the context. So, so that's what I'm going to do today. Joseph, let me remind you, maybe you weren't here last week when, we, when, I, when I introduced Joseph, or maybe it's been a while since you've read the story of Joseph. Let me sort of add some color, some flavor, so that you remember who this guy is. Joseph was the favored of the 12 brothers. You remember their father, Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. He grew up in a super dysfunctional family. Uh, Jacob grew up uh, where his brother Esau was always the favored son. Uh, his brother Esau, he was the, the hunter-gatherer. He was the big, strong guy. He was the outdoorsman. And, and, and so, so Jacob's father always preferred Esau. And man, that'll screw you up, right? So, so Jacob grew up in that scenario, super dysfunctional, dad always favoring his brother. And so I suppose that Jacob must have grown up with the, with, the, with the mindset of, I'll never be like him. I'll never be like my dad. I'll never play favorites. I'll never put my children through that. I'll never, I'll never let my children go through what I have gone through. But then, as we talked about last week, because our dysfunction is not a choice, it's just the brokenness that, that we are dealt in life. Uh, he, he moves into adulthood. He has 12 kids, and guess what? He does the same darn thing. He favors one son. That's Joseph, and he gives him a, a coat of many colors. And every day, the other, the other 11 brothers have to look at that. As if it wasn't, it wasn't bad enough that they, they know that he gets, he, gets the, the, he gets the white meat in the chicken and we get the, we get the dark meat, you know. Uh, he gets the, the big room and we get the little rooms. Uh, he, you know, he gets time with Dad and we never do. Uh, now Dad gives him, gives him this coat, that, like this, this marker that, that he's my favorite of you boys. So, so Joseph was the favored and he wears a coat every day to represent this, this special love that his father has for him. And it's this, it's this actual physical symbol of the dysfunction that's brewing in their family. And as we read last week, Joseph has these dreams. And we know, because we've read the rest of Genesis, we know that, that they're truly prophetic dreams. Like, like, this is going to come to pass. But don't let that, don't let that cause you to miss the fact that, that Joseph, as a 17-year-old, he's a jerk. Uh, as a 17-year-old, yeah, he's having prophetic dreams. They are truly prophetic. They are going to come to pass. And yet, yet he's, he's a 17-year-old, a spoiled, rotten brat, and his brothers hate him for it. So, so, he, so Joseph has these dreams of how he would one day rule over his brothers, and, and, and these dreams about how he would, 
He would, he would rule over his mom and dad. And it wasn't enough that he had the dreams. He would tell them of the dreams. And his life is about to change as a result forever. With that said, let's read Genesis chapter 37. I'll read, along, I'll read out loud. You, you follow along silently. <clears throat> now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel, that's the dad, Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he, Israel, said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. Just some obscure, some random dude finds Joseph wandering in the fields. And the man <clears throat> asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, Joseph said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, they have gone away, for I have heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Dad's not around to protect him. Let's kill him. Verse 19, they said to one another, here, here, comes this, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We might say, let's throw him into a, a dry bed, Rissaka. Then, then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. These are the other 11 brothers. Really, probably 10, ten brothers. Um, but when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. This is the, this is the oldest of the brothers. Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. And he had, a, he, had a, he had an intention, there was an intention to his words. It says, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, which really, in the original language, the implication is that they just really stripped him naked um, in, a, in, a, in a shameful act. The robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, um, said to his, what, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not... Um, and, and, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother. He is our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. And so now we have um, an act of human trafficking. The Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. <clears throat> they, the the, uh, the human traffickers, uh, they took Joseph to Egypt, and when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, again, this is the oldest brother, he tore his clothes, meaning he was just distraught. And he returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Meaning now I'm responsible to dad. Then they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat and they dipped the robe in blood and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify where, uh, whether it is your son's robe or, or not. And he identified the dad 
Israel, Jacob, formerly Jacob, he identified it and he said, it, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for days, or many days. Uh, <clears throat> all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. In other words, for the, the rest of my days, until I die, I will mourn. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold uh, Joseph uh, in Egypt to Potiphar, Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. So we have, um, we have, we have hatred. These are the sins that we've experienced in this little story. Hatred and deceit. We have the sins of human trafficking and, and slavery. And then we have this particularly pitiful sin, tricking and, and, and lying to this, this elderly old man who will for the next several years or decades live with the lie that his son is dead. And the question that we want to answer today is, where is God in the middle of all of this. And the reason that's such a relevant question is some of you check that perhaps all of us are asking the same question. Where is God in the middle of all of this? Let me tell you the rest of the story. We, over the next several weeks, we're going to read Genesis 38 and on through 50. And you're going to hear the rest of the story, and you've probably heard it before, but let me just remind you. Let me just remind you what happens in this story and the rest of the story. Joseph is sold. He's, he's, he's trafficked, and he's sold into slavery. It's easy because we've seen this story, like, caricatured. We've seen it in cartoon fashion. We've seen it in musical fashion. It's it's easy to clean this story up and make it something, you know, it's in the Bible. It must not be that bad. Let me just assure you, it's that bad. Um, the, 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 the idea of human trafficking and, and slavery, even to this day, is, is, is it's terror. Uh, and it was in that day, probably worse. So, so Joseph is sold. He's sold to Potiphar, uh, and then Potiphar's wife lies to Potiphar about Joseph. And so Joseph goes from being the, the slave in the house, he goes to being uh, a, uh, confined to a dungeon in prison. And he rots in prison for a number of years. And he's continuing to have prophetic dreams, and his prophetic dreams are confirmed, and yet no one gets him out of this stinking, rotten prison cell. But then over the course of time, things begin to change. And they change, uh, when they begin to change, they change rather rapidly. And God, <coughs> the hand of God, esteem, esteems uh, Joseph. He esteems him to the point where Joseph, in this foreign land, in Egypt, is second in command. In other words, he is the most powerful. Under Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, Joseph is second only to Pharaoh. He does Pharaoh's bidding. Pharaoh says, when Joseph says something, it's as though I said something. And ultimately what happens, you'll get the color of the stories in the next few weeks, but ultimately what happens, 
decades later, is that, 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 that Joseph, a foreigner in Egypt, Joseph has the, the privilege and the responsibility of saving his, um, his family, the Israelites, uh, saving them uh, from famine. A global famine arises and people are, are truly dying because they, they're starving to death. They don't have enough food to eat. And, and, and Jacob and his wives and his 11 sons and his, uh, his uh, uh, daughters and his, his workers, his servants, they all come to the foreign land of Egypt not knowing that, is, that, 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 uh, that, that Joseph is there. And Joseph is the second uh, in command. Uh, he could have killed them. That would have been pretty normal. But instead, he welcomes them in and he shows them favor, and the nation of Israel in its budding form is saved so that ultimately one day Jesus might come out of that line and that lineage. Now, does that make it all right? Does that make it all good? Does that mean, does that, mean that, that, I, like, that I can say, okay, yeah, so suffering, suffering's good because, you know, it all turned out well. Well, it's not quite that simple, is it? Not in my life, my suffering, not in your life. The way suffering really plays out is more like this next scene that I want to paint for you. Twice in the book of Genesis, Joseph's brothers ask a really gut-wrenching question. Once they've uh, become reacquainted with their brother, he's now a ruler in the land and they're they're peons. Uh, once, the, once the dad finds out, oh, Joseph didn't die. You, just, you guys lied to me about this. You know, all the dysfunction comes to light, and, but, but they're trying to make it right. They're trying to bring this you know, dysfunctional family back together. You've been there. It's Christmas time, and you're just, you're just trying to not make any waves. You're just trying to bring it together, trying to hold it to get together, trying to make the most of a bad situation. Twice in the book of Genesis, during that period, things just, they're not, they're not, they're not well yet. They're, they're getting better, but they're not well. Twice, Joseph's brother asked a gut-wrenching question, which, which, uh, which goes something like this. How in the world could we have done such damage? Like, how in the world did such evil arise out of us, come at our hands, that we would do such a thing to our own flesh and blood. Not, not only Joseph, but we would do such a thing to our dad. They seem to ask a question that goes something like this. How could such evil and trickery be inside of us? And where, where was God in all of this damage that has been done at our hands? Maybe you have asked that of your parent or your former spouse. Maybe you've asked this very question of a loved one. You've said this, how could you have done me so wrong? How could you have willingly inflicted so much pain in my life? How could you do that? It's as though you're a monster. And perhaps you've asked the following question, which is, and God, where were you in all of this? And Joseph answers the question. See, 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 Joseph is no longer the 17-year-old spoiled rotten brat that he used to be. He's now, he's now a seasoned man of faith. Decades of sorrow and suffering and God's faithfulness has now been proved in his life. And so when his brothers ask that question more than once, you know how it is, you, you ask a question, but then just because of this dysfunction, because of the pain, you, you wait a few years and you ask it again, right? It's just, it's not all healed up yet. It's still a wound. When they asked him the question the first time, he says this. He says to his brothers, and now do not be distressed 
or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Boy, that's, that's hard to say to your perpetrator, right? Don't, don't, be, don't be mad at yourself. I'm fine. It's hard, it's hard to come to that point, right? It's much easier, much more natural just to continue to hold them accountable, to continue to be angry, to, to never forgive them. But he said, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Whose life? Their life. So God sent me here that your life might be spared. The famine. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five more years in which there will, neither, uh, there will be neither plowing nor harvest. What's he doing? He's prophesying. God has told him seven years. Five more years. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant of on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors so it was not you who sent me here but God they ask him the question again five chapters later when daddy dies and like oh no now we're in trouble daddy's dead Surely Joseph will exact, exact vengeance on us now. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us. <laughs> yeah, you think? And pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, and I believe this was a lie, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of, of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Clear evidence that the that the pain has not yet healed, right? Clear evidence that there's still this nagging dysfunction. Like they're trying to bring it together. They're trying to make good. They're trying to forgive all of the, all of the wrongs, but, but he's weeping. There's still that, that fresh pain. He's, he's the ruler in the land. And they're, they're simple peons, and yet, yet he's the one weeping. Um, so, so Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Think on that. Like, you don't have to treat us like your brother. Just, just treat us like trash, but spare our lives. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Do not fear, for, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. Which people? Them, the brother. That, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So, a reasonable question that Joseph attempts to answer is, where's God in all of this? Even more specific Think on this question. How can a good God work through sin? Right? I, I don't, I don't, that's one of those questions I cannot fully answer because I cannot fully fathom, but no doubt it's right here in the passage. God works through sin. We have the spe spectacular sins of rage and attempted murder and slavery and the willful deceit of an elderly old man. And God works right in the middle of it. He doesn't just, he just, doesn't just come behind and clean up the mess. He works actively in the middle of the messes that we make. Uh, I got three big ideas. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put them out there unpack them briefly, but I feel like the story, the context of the story really kind of preaches itself. 
Big idea number one, number one is this. God was purposeful in Joseph's suffering. He was not passive in Joseph's suffering. He was purposeful. And dear friends, if we are Christians, and many of us are, then a Christian ethic, a Christian belief, if you're going to be a Christian, you must, you must embrace this truth. God is purposeful in your suffering. You, you may not understand that. You may not see that yet. Of course we don't. Because we're not God. But he's not passive. He is purposeful. Many, many years later, the psalmist wrote this psalm, and it's, it's about Joseph. And it says that when God summoned a famine, what does that mean? That means God brought about famine. When God spins hurricanes into existence... When God causes the, the, the plates of the earth to, to rumble and twist and scrape against one another. When God call, causes volcanoes to, to erupt. When, when God summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, verse 17 he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph. He had sent a man ahead of him, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. You see, God summoned a famine, and God sent Joseph ahead as a slave to be the Savior many decades later of his family. God did that. Now, I, I, have, I have purposed for the rest of my life, I won't be so callous as to say that God has chosen to make your life hell or, or to give you cancer or to cause your relationships to go bad. But, but what I will say is that God is strong. And God is so good. And God is so purposeful that he is purposeful in your suffering. He's not passive. He's purposeful. Second big idea is this. God was compassionate in Joseph's suffering. God wasn't complacent, but he was compassionate in Joseph's suffering. Just one little example, I would say, is, is that the, the God gave, gave, repeatedly, God gave Joseph this supernatural gift of prophecy. While he's in the middle of a stinking prison cell, God is prophesying through Joseph. Now, I'd rather just not be in the prison cell, but if you're, if you're going to be in a prison cell, for God to give you that gracious gift, the prophecy, and to, to let it unfold right, right in front of you so that you're like, well, I'm in a prison. You know, it really stinks here. I'm being beaten daily. Um, but but, but, but God, just, God just spoke to me prophetically, and it just came to pass right there before my eyes. God is compassionate, not complacent, but God is compassionate in Joseph's suffering. Think on this. A 17-year-old, spoiled, rotten brat of a kid, probably destined to uh, fulfill the dysfunction that his grandfather and his father had already fulfilled. And what happens in his life? It's brutal. It's suffering, but what happens in his life? With grace, God broke into the life of this self-centered, selfish, hedonistic young man on a path to destruction, and he changes his life forever. He does it through suffering, but he changes the course of Joseph's life forever, and he gets to be written up in the Bible. 
understand this. The Bible is not just a bunch of, of, of Bible stories, a bunch of moral essay, essays on how to be a good person. If so, th- this story today is a really bad lesson on how to be a good person. I encourage you as parents, that is not how we teach the Bible to our children. Be like Joseph. Be like David. Be, the, the story of the Bible is how God's grace breaks into our brokenness. It, it, it penetrates all of the dark places of our lives. How God's grace makes its way into our broken lives. Often against our own will, but for our own good. The tragedy was actually a blessing in Joseph's life. That's my point. You see, if you don't trust that God is, is, is a good daddy, you're going to quit too soon. In your suffering, today, in your suffering, if you don't trust that God is purposeful, if you don't trust that God is compassionate, if you don't trust that God is a good daddy, you quit too soon. God is compassionate. In Isaiah 53, it says that Jesus was, Jesus himself was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He understands. In Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus is, Jesus is described as a sympathetic counselor or high priest, meaning he understands. He was beaten and bruised and abandoned, and he understands He is compassionate toward your suffering. God was purposeful, not passive in Joseph's suffering. God was compassionate, not complacent in his suffering. The third, the last big idea is this. God exalted Joseph when his suffering was over. He made him the ruler of the land. He made him the the savior of the nation of Israel. But, But not only the nation of Israel. He saved all the Egyptians because they were not prepared for famine until Joseph came in and led them in a campaign. He became the ruler of the land He became the savior of the nation of Israel. Famine would have wiped his family off the earth. Famine would have wiped perhaps all of Egypt from the earth. God saved nations through Joseph by sending him ahead. Let me say that again. God saved nations through Joseph by sending him ahead. And the means by which God did so was tragic suffering. The Christian ethic, a Christian belief that we must embrace if we are Christ's followers is Psalm 30. It says this, Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. God ultimately exalted Joseph. He esteemed him. And dear friends, sons and daughters of the living God, his intention when your suffering is over When you have gone through what you are to go through, his intention is to exalt, to esteem, to lift you up as well. As we're we're just about done talking about suffering for today, and as we, as our desire is to, to say, okay, what is a biblical view on suffering. 
I don't know why that person suffers in that country. I don't know why I had to go through this. I don't know what. I can't answer every question, but, but what I want to do is I want to build, I'm speaking for all of us now, we want to build a foundation, a biblical view on suffering, and then, then, that's the rock-solid foundation on which we stand as we make our way through suffering. So, so in conclusion, what, what, what are we standing on here? Well, three truths. One is, that, that God is purposeful in my suffering. The second is that God is compassionate in my suffering. He understands this isn't my fault. Your suffering is not punishment for bad behavior. It's not your fault. The, God, is, God is compassionate. And, and the third truth is that God will one day exalt you. He will one day exalt you so, so that you will be able to say, for, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that will be one day revealed in my life. Last thought. Joseph was little s savior of the world. But he's also a picture for us of Jesus, big S, Savior of the world. Joseph, some would call him a type of Jesus. He is a picture, foreshadowing, a symbol. If Joseph had not suffered for the many, think on this, the many would have been lost. If Jesus had not suffered for the many, the many would have been lost. One person's sacrifice saved many people. That is the story of Jesus. I read from Isaiah 53. You can just close your eyes and listen, and then we'll pray. Isaiah 53 says this, Surely he, Jesus, has borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. Would you bow with me in prayer?